This is a podcast with Peter Moon and Jonathan Gee, dated October 10th, 2018. And today we're going to be discussing the work of Jonathan Gee and also that of Jonathan D or John D. Uh, good morning, Jonathan. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. And I want to introduce you uh, to my audience or to those who are listening to this podcast and are not familiar with you. Go All ahead. Right. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I just turned 41. I'm a Libra, and my birthday was two days ago or so. Uh, I, in that 41 years, I have managed to accomplish very little that I can show for myself financially. But I have produced a copious amount of work that I hope is of benefit to humanity. Um, a lot of it is metaphysical. Most of it is metaphysical. Uh, some of it is esoteric in nature and some of it is more uh, science-based as opposed to uh, past definitions of science. Uh, and the Enochian system falls into both of those. Uh, categories because uh, it was scientific at the time that it was uh, initially, uh, I guess we should say invented, not discovered, uh, but it was considered science then and if one updates it with what we consider science now, then the framework still holds and uh, the model is, is modernized into a, uh, a working format. Thank you. That's okay. That's um, I would like to uh, emphasize or re-emphasize the fact that yes, uh, Jonathan has done a, a copious amount of literature uh, videos that are available on YouTube and whatnot, and on his website. Give us your website, Jonathan. Uh, my website is www.benpadia.com. B-E-N-P-A-D. I A H dot com. Okay, and I, I, my I, primary website. I also have a website called uh, the Pythagorean Order of Death dot Ning, uh, and that's all one word. Okay, <laughs> thank you, thank you, and I want to clarify that you know my interest or how I found out about Jonathan was because of his videos on Doctor John D and the Anakian system that he had. Uh, sort of color-coded the the sigil de Amit. And I want to also talk just a bit before we go into the sigil de Amit, is my interest in it. It's not my exclusive interest in it, but so much of it has been precipitated by my work with uh, time control scientist Dr. David Anderson, because he will often appear in my life coincident with uh, stuff that comes up it, that has to do with magic or occultism. And j just to give you an example of this, I, for some reason yesterday, I just felt like it. I have a t-shirt with the sigil, damn it, uh, and I put it on yesterday. I said, it's, it's the right day to wear this t-shirt. And I get an email from him for the first time in over a year. And the email is, is a very just casual, well, it's a polite, it's almost a formal email because he's uh, offering his condolences on the Preston of pa uh, the passing of Preston Nichols, who just passed away on October 5th, five days ago from today. So I hear from him. It, it, it's, I, I think I mentioned this to you when we spoke earlier. So I put on this t-shirt, I'm interviewing you, and I hear from him. This is the whole point of my interest in how I got interested in your work because when I started watching your videos all of a sudden I was able to understand his his work in a much clearer way on his website which is no longer available his website's no longer available of course I'd already been indoctrinated in the information six years prior during his lectures in Romania however uh, I'm 
you know, seeking you out in, just because of the magical component. So what was so remarkable about the work, this is a context of why I'm interested in Jonathan Gee, but it was so interesting that you had taken the sigil and the, the sigil is, uh, how, would, how would you describe the sigil? You're more familiar with it than me. Uh, geometrically, it is a circle containing a heptagon which is a seven-sided uh, shape that contains a heptagram, which is a seven-pointed star. Uh, and then inside of the heptagon and the heptagram, uh, in most versions of the Salem Day Meth, is a pentagram, which is a five-pointed star. Okay. And now what, what he has done is he has correlated a very complex... Um, system of divination slash necromancy into a understandable, cohesive, as understandable as can be, because it's very challenging to the mind to try and grasp this particular sigil, which means the sigil of truth. And I should give a little bit of background, is that this sigil was used in what you call channelings or, or mediumistic interactions with John D. and Edward Kelly, where they were, uh, Edward Kelly in particular, contacting the angelic realm. And these angels identified themselves as being the same angels which steered the power of King Solomon, as from the Bible. So these, this was a very powerful paradigm that John D. and Edward Kelly were working with. And it's a very interesting paradigm. There are, are literally thousands of people across the world who study this very passionately, and they take it very seriously. How successful they are with it is, of course, debatable. But what Jonathan has done is he has he's sort of used colors to explain it and correspond, show the correspondences Anything you further you can add to clarify what I just said? Uh, well, there's a couple of points that uh, came to mind while you're speaking. Uh, one, the uh, Enochian material that Dee and Kelly uh, generated is, as you say, very complex. It's very encrypted and very uh, complexly encrypted. Uh, and the color coding is a means of simplifying that encryption methodology to try and make it simpler to visualize uh, what in black and white is more difficult, more obfuscated. Well, what was most... Uh, Go ahead. The, the uh, Enochian material supposedly is uh, older even than King Solomon and predates even uh, Noah and the Flood. Uh, and the name of it... Uh, is attributed to Enoch, the patriarch Enoch, who was, I think, the grandfather, great-grandfather, something like that, of Noah in one lineage, and he was a relative of Noah's in another lineage as well. It, it's complicated at that point. It gets confusing. Well, but, um, go ahead. Yeah. Just on that. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the only other thing I was, I was thinking of saying was that... Um, there were uh, grimoires uh, that dealt with uh, the uh, methodology of summoning the uh, entities that Solomon, King Solomon, supposedly summoned to build the, sec uh, the first temple. Uh, there were grimoires of that nature available at this time, but uh, the Enochian system that D and Kelly uh, used and may have generated doesn't appear in literature anywhere before their time. So if they did use the Solomonic uh, Goetic uh, grimoires to summon initially uh, the intelligences that they then used and attributed to be Enochian, uh, theurgic, uh, angelic, uh, nature, uh, na uh, natural deities, uh, then even so, the material that they generated was unique from the uh, traditional um, 
grimoires of the lesser and greater key, uh, keys of Solomon. What your uh, statements just basically tell us is that there is an ancient body of literature where human beings took very seriously the dialogue with disembodied entities. So you have to understand that thousands and thousands of years ago, um, what, the stuff that we know today as channeling or medium mystic contacts has been around with us as long as human beings have been around. And of course, it, yeah. yes, and it would have taken a much different color uh, thousands and thousands of years ago than it, than it would have today. Although it's, it does have this similar aspect that it's, it does not identify itself as a ordinary human dialogue. And, but what was so interesting about your work is that, is that when you use colors to sort of descramble some of the mystery of the sigil, your, those colors identify, are identifiable within the sigil, sigil itself because you, it says each, I think it's each astro, uh, day of the week has a color attributed to it in, in standard occultism. Am I correct? Uh, you didn't pick the colors. They sort of picked themselves, correct? Well, there's... Uh, let me back it up just one second. Um, scrying uh, is basically what we're doing right now. You and I, we're talking at a computer. Uh, it's not much different than what Dan Kelly were doing with their crystal ball or what Nostradamus did with water or Nefadis was the Egyptian scribe who was attributed with the invention of it, or at least the uh, first writing down of some methods for it. Uh, we're basically scrying right now, and I don't know if he was communicating with uh, more intelligent beings than we are now or not. Uh, most people still haven't cracked the code that he was using to uh, communicate in, even today, but that that's neither here nor there. Uh, the... Um, I'm sorry, I've lost my train of thought here. What was the? I was asking you about the colors. The colors, the colors I said, yes. they, they picked themselves. You didn't. You and you recognized them, as opposed to you well, saying this is going to be green and this is going to be orange. Yeah, traditionally the colors that are attributed to the days of the week and the archangels are um, not necessarily the same as the colors that I used. The colors that I used were the spectrum of Roy G. Biv from dividing white light in a prism because to me that was intuitive other people since I did that also uh, have tried to make a corrected version by using the colors that are in uh, for example 777 and other works on uh, magical color correspondence uh, that are usually attributed to the angelic uh, the archangels into the days of the week uh, but I use the spectrum of light well, the spectrum of light, and did you use? Did you correspond it to the material that's in that's on on the sigil? I mean, how did you choose? This color goes with that. Uh, I think I basically just went uh, purple to red, or purple to uh, right. Uh, yeah, um, left to right, and as the days and uh, archangels in the sigilum were given. Uh, just left to right as well. So even though, uh, if I recall correctly, D's ordering for the planetary attributes does differ from, say, the ordering of the attributes in the Magus by uh, William Barrett, which was a couple of centuries later, but compiled much of the same information, or even Cornelius Agrippa's ordering of the uh, talismanic uh, camia attributes associated with the archangels in the days of the week. Uh, I stuck with D's ordering for the Siglum Day meth of the planetary attributes uh, that, that he used, and then just across the board went along the spectrum light. Okay, now what, what's very obvious is that with some of the, not only the, the color coding that you did with the sigil, which makes certain aspects of the sigil stand out and makes them identifiable and therefore to some degree understandable, it seems to me that you've 
uh, greatly added to the potential to understand this device, even to the point where you're understanding it from a perspective that John D. didn't necessarily have. Well, I think a lot of the material that D worked with is like that. I think it's meant as a perennial, traditional kind of material meant to be passed along from one generation to the next and added on by what knowledge we gain with each new iteration. Um, the Golden Dawn improved on D's system somewhat, and in my own work, I tried to improve on the Golden Dawn's work as well. Well, from my understanding of the Golden Dawn, uh, shared with me by Joseph Matheny, who used to be a member of it, he said they were not using the right, uh, the right stuff at all, and that they were, uh, you know, Crowley didn't use their stuff. In other words, it was altered. Elphia, right, Elf, right. Eliphas Levi had altered it. So you had a, a, a great society kind of like uh, pissing in the wind or, or worse. No, I, would, I, I would concur with that. A lot of the work that I did with the Golden Dawn material was fixing what appeared to be mistakes um, if they weren't intentional uh, obfuscations. Um, a lot of what we have to do is fix repetition of error uh, in encryption and in particularly number squares and letter squares. If someone messes up a single you know, jot or tittle, it changes the numerical sum value for the entire thing. But in that context, uh, if there's a predicted outcome like a uh, magic number sum for a magic uh, number squares, then it should be possible to fix the error. And I found that that was true with a lot of the Enochian material in spite of Mathers and even uh, Rarity and Crowley's own uh, attributes. There were some that could be improved on. Okay, so when we're talking about uh, correct use of the sigil, correct interpretation, what, in your opinion, is the, the difference between, obviously this stuff is stirring up entities galore. What is the difference between, say, having it correct and not having it correct, in your estimation? <clears throat> well, that's a very good question. Uh, I shy away from all forms of summoning, evocation, invocation, and ritual practical magic personally because I don't know that there is an absolutely right methodology. Uh, what I've worked with myself uh, in terms of trying to simplify and make more easily accessible the encryption methodology uh, that D used, it doesn't necessarily make the angelic summoning magic that goes along with that easier, better, uh, more effective, or in the uh, opposite case, any worse or less effective uh, that I'm aware of, because I haven't, as I say, I haven't used it in practical magic myself. Now, in terms of intelligences that do get stirred up, I, the way I would explain that personally is that essentially uh, the, the video that I... Uh, that I watched recently that you recommended. Uh, what was it, Terrence? Uh, it was Vincent Bridges. I, I Vincent, suggested Vincent. you watch the videos, of Vincent, a video of Vincent Bridges. Go right. ahead. Uh, I, I would concur with a lot of his conclusions in that uh, particular video, which was presented in, uh, by him and Dan Winter at the uh, uh, conference a few years back. Um, that Was that held in Prague? That particular uh, many of his conferences thing. have been so I would assume yes it, it probably was a lot of it uh, dealt with the uh, geography of that area as well which I hadn't known about I found fascinating to learn uh, particularly the backstory with Edward Kelly after he had separated from D I didn't follow that in my own research so learning about his horrific experiences was quite fascinating um, but yeah, I think in terms of the intelligences that get stirred up, it's very inspiring. A lot of these uh, are new ideas or channeling pathways to new ideas that we wouldn't 
necessarily have our own work we to use these methods. Uh, Crowley described it as uh, like dialing in a number to a phone. Uh, you have the phone book, that's the grimoire, you look up the number of the entity you want to summon, which is the signal, and then you call them up using the traditional manner, um, and you have a conversation. But he also compared that to accessing different neural pathways in our own brains, and I tend to side with that. I think a lot of the, uh, a lot of the inspirations that we get from working with the OJ and, and spiritual and good or white magic uh, are just inspirations from a better future. You know, ourselves in a better world mind, superior to our own present, in which we're mired down and bogged down by material concerns. And I don't think those are necessarily supernatural per se. Uh, I think they're a part of nature, and we ignore them most of the time. So uh, doing a specifically ritual act to access them is uh, just a way of saying I'm not going to ignore these now. I'm going to focus on the, only this ideal realm for now. But I don't think there's any necessarily right way or wrong way of doing that uh, okay. necessarily. Okay, very, very good. Okay, so it's interesting that you basically are a, a scholar of this information and not a practicing magician. Am I correct? Uh, that is true. I'm more of a scholar than a practicing magician, and it's not uncommon, however, for there to be that divide between those who practice and those who study it but don't practice. Traditionally in Kabbalah, it's the same way. Uh, there are people who study it and uh, are scholars in it, but don't use it in any practical manner. And then there are people who use it in practical manner to create golems and to, you know, summon spirits or communicate with ritual uh, magical methods. Well, th this is this gives you a great advantage because so much, so many of the times, people practicing it are seeking uh, things that aren't don't always, in the end, serve their own best interests. It's very easy to get lost in this uh, debris or sea of occultism. The but what I would also say. And I will just give an example of an astrologer I know uh, who was not particularly gifted with regards to being psychic, but he had a very, I guess what you call scholastic understanding of ast astrology. And so when he'd begin reading a chart, he would then sort of go into default psychic mode where he'd actually become psychic, you know, because it was so clear to him what he was seeing in the chart was, and he could just run with it. It would, he would go into psychic mode by default. And I can't help but think that, you know, if you become acquainted and familiar with a lot of this stuff, that you might get certain hits of either, whether they be sources of information or entities themselves manifesting. Any comment on that? Yeah, no, I agree with that entirely. Um, it's just a matter of being a matter of being open-minded. Uh, I think telepathies, uh, the ability to be psychic, uh, in terms of uh, clairvoyance and telepathy, uh, aren't extrasensory uh, elements or extrasensory uh, aspects of perception, but are normal, healthy ways of communicating and thinking uh, that have been suppressed in modern times. Well, this gets to my next point, which is sort of a, uh, either a reinterpretation or a reiteration of, or amplification of what you said. It's like you talked about uh, these constructs that Dr. John D. offered us or cavorted with, with the sigil and, and even with his contacts are stimulating, as Crowley had suggested, stimulating neural 
pathways, ancient neural pathways that the ordinary human is not in Congress with. And, and this is a fascinating prospect because if you just take the example of a hallucinatory experience where the mind can create schematics that are, you know, uh, bridge right into infinity and can even reach into intelligence that the human did not have. It, it may not even be intelligence that's in his own brain per se. It's only in his brain because the brain is tied to the collective. So he could be picking up on some scientists like Einstein or Tesla and, and be actually interpreting their work in great detail. That, that is a capacity that probably exists within uh, most, if not all, of human brains to, to visualize. So this, all of these patterns of knowledge and creation are, are within the brain. And then how it's interpreted when it comes out, whether it comes out through, you know, Enochian angels or uh, ghosts on a cheap TV show or whatever it is, it's, these are interpretations of what is being stirred up by the neural pathways that can go into very deep aspects um, that you know we're just not even aware of. So this is literally exploring uh, the collective unconscious and beyond. And when you get a character like Dr. John D, he's he's cavorting, he's dialoguing with this collective unconsciousness in a like, like as if he's dealing with a council and there is a dialogue back and forth and they teach him, they tell him to do this. And this is part of how the sigil manifests and the whole Enochian language manifests. He is in concert, in Congress or in dialogue with entities that are outside of the realm of, you know, what would be considered ordinary humanity. Your comment. Uh, I would agree. I'd say that it's it may be paranormal, but it's not supernatural. Uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of what you said is very very true. The schematics that you can uh, that you can channel uh, or interpret uh, in a hallucination are only uh, of as much value as they are use, though. So if you bring back something that's too complicated that people can't understand. They tend to kill you for it. Uh, also, um, um, the uh, belief that we can communicate with some form of intelligence inherent or innate within nature that is greater than our own is ancient in the extreme as well as shamanic in nature. Uh, the same is true of plant medicine, uh, where people say that um, the plants themselves taught the original indigenous peoples how to cultivate them in a manner that would be the most effective at producing uh, psycho-holistic uh, results. Uh, uh, the same essentially goes for what Dee is saying in terms of trying to read the mind of God and then communicating with uh, angels that were sent to him. Uh, in, a, in a way that could interpret for him what he was seeking to find. But if you, if you aren't seeking anything, then there's no reason to, uh, to <laughs> like, again, this goes back to the uh, groups who practice as opposed to study. Uh, I don't have any needs that I would want to use magic to achieve, personally. So I don't have any draw towards that. Uh, that most people that I know of who do magic uh, feel the need to use it for some specific goal. Um, I, I, under, I understand that. And let me uh, uh, turn this in the direction of, of how I come into concert with this phenomena. And in particular, as it... Uh, as it relates to, you know, the, the stories, legends, science, and, you know, of, of time travel that, that I've been in, involved with for over the last 25 years, beginning with my collaboration with Preston Nichols. And 
what, what I'm saying here is, I guess I would say is, is my first attempt to verify uh, that the Montauk Project story did have some validity resulted in discovering synchronicity uh, with the names of Cameron and Wilson, which led me directly to the door of Marjorie Cameron. And she was the first one to tell me about the work of John Dee and Edward Kelly. She told me that, that Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard were trying to emulate the work of, of, of both of those magicians. And there was even a superimposition of their personages uh, on Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard. And this would uh, explain, uh, perhaps to her, explain to her why Hubbard turned into a rogue is in terms of uh, absconding with Jack Parsons' wife and, uh, and uh, what was it, um, his, his money, his, his boat, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, so, so anyway, um, the, the, the point here, though, is that I have encountered magic. And, and with the personage of Dr. David Anderson, who's, who's the most intriguing character to come along with regards to time travel, because he has actual science to back it up, and he has an actual device, and probably has more than one of them, a time reactor, which can actually effectuate time travel, which brings a, a lot of other questions to, to rise that we won't particularly go into, except that, well, I, I would say one of the issues, one of the, there, there are, one of the problems in, with his whole, with the paradigm of all this technology is what you call censorship. He says that is the main tool that governments use, which is censorship. So now when we're talking about the sigil or all of this, it all has to do with cryptology. So you see that there is governments use cryptology and to, to hide what they're doing, which is obvious. That's, that's how you maintain power is by censoring information and who can have access to what. So when we move up into the arena of time travel, which can literally change history, uh, it can change whole governments. There is a different order of government than than the regular government that we are are all familiar with and that is that is a hierarchy of um entities virtual entities that guard certain aspects of the neural pathways of the mind now if, if you're exploring ancient occultism you know, you have to pass these pathways to access those areas of the mind. And they're obviously not for the ordinary human. The, the ordinary human has to go on an exploration, on an adventure to even learn about them, let alone occupy those neural pathways. And this has all been mapped out for centuries. The mapping is one thing. The traveling of the path is an entirely different thing. And one of my favorite quotes from Alfred Korzybski uh, is that the map is not the territory. The map is a representation of the territory. When you go out into the territory, you might find that the map is different. So anyway, when I'm in the territorial waters of Dr. David Anderson, so to speak, I'm also in the territorial waters of these neural pathways that you alluded to earlier, uh, referencing Crowley, you alluded to them that so one is stimulating these unconscious uh, fjords, valleys, pathways of of creation that are connected to the human mind and the human brain. So this is so. In other words, I, I go into this territory and I say, "Wow, this is this is similar." What and and it's all has to do with the control or the architecture of the universe itself and the status quo control. Your comment. Once again, I agree. Um, when you talk about uh, the angelic or even the goetic uh, entities as being gatekeepers of knowledge, 
that some people might not be ready yet for uh, without certain preparatory processes. Uh, that's logical. Uh, shouldn't be controversial. But um, the only thing I would disagree with is I think perhaps that the map and the territory can be the same, but I'm not sure. The uh, They wouldn't necessarily be on a one-to-one -one size scale with one another, but they could be on such an exact uh, microcosmic, macrocosmic scale of similitude that one could, in a sense, travel without going anywhere. Uh, if one had, for example, Braille, um, one can read through touch as opposed to sight, but if one had a for example, a globe of uh, the Earth that was topographically accurate and you could feel the terrain, uh, in some sense that might give one the same kind of visual capacity for understanding the world from outside of it. Uh, of course, you, you can have a, a very good map. I mean, and, and with you know today's technology, you can have a much better map than you could have you know, 40, 50, hundreds of years ago. Yes. Granted. Um, and I think that's part of it, is the development of technology improves, and therefore the difference in scale begins to break down. Uh, virtual reality and regular reality may reach a singularity point where they're indistinguishable from one another and become one and the same Well, one of the construct. things, with regards to ancient knowledge that we're talking about, that's, for to a large degree, set in... Um, archives and, and, you know, parchment, you know, that's, that have been decaying and all this sort of thing. We're moving into a time where a lot of these things will find their way into holographic representations. Um, as I speak, there are uh, activities to take certain aspects of secret societies and to put them into uh, virtual reality scenarios as part of an educational process which will make a lot of the information of secret societies come alive. It'll also tend to dispel a lot of the secrecy of the, of the stuff because there's a lot of secrecy games that are played in secret societies that are non-productive to everyone, even to, especially to the aspirants in those societies. So as, as the actual truth of the ancient rituals gets exposited and what they really mean, uh, the secrecy kind of blows away. And, 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 of course, the, the, it's replaced with understanding and knowledge instead of, you know, a bunch of people running around, chickens with their head cut off. Some of which is, there is a need to, to guard knowledge, but there's also a great proclivity to misuse that, that aspect and to seize on the secrecy to manipulate and obfuscate the truth. But anyway, when I, when I get to the issue of... Um, you know, the, the censorship and, you know, one of John D's angels, uh, Michael, I believe it was, said to him uh, when John D had scolded him for not showing up on time, he says, we, we moveth time, time does not moveth us, or words to that effect. So in other words, they are position themselves as being senior to time. So when we go into the prospect of changing time, whether it be on an individual level or a collective level, we are hitting up against an authoritative censorship that, that does not want it to take place unless we are properly licensed. And I say that metaphorically. So Dr. David Anderson has a technology which can change time. It can be used for a multiplicity of causes. Um, one of which is preserving life organs so that they continue in a stasis form so that they can be used. That's a very practical, seemingly non-threatening application. Um, there's also, you could also put atomic waste in a time reactor so as to make it decay more rapidly and dissipate it. The, uh, but when it comes down to literally moving back and saying, you know, we didn't win that Little League game. I'm going to go back and we're going to change the fact that I won that Little League game. 
you know, something that seems, might seem innocuous, but it, that could change the lives of everybody who played the, in the game, uh, significantly or insignificantly. So in other words, and, and then if you start having multiple people doing that, you're having, you're creating a multiplicity of chaos. So therefore, the lords of order are going to show up, even if you didn't invoke them, because you're, you're now, it's, it's just like if you could start uh, finding keys to banks and start writing checks galore, and you, you found a way for the bank to cover them, you know, perpetrate fraud on the banks, but, but no, you, nobody could detect you. The only way they could detect you is to say, you know, you now have a, a, you know, a trillion dollars that you didn't have six weeks ago. Um, that's kind of what will happen in a situation where you exercise a skill or power that is, you know, that others do not have. So David Anderson has a time reactor, uh, what's called a temporal tremor detector. So if somebody's experimenting with time, and th these, this thing is connected to a satellite, but basically if you're connect, experimenting with time, he can go knock on your door and say, hey, I know you've been doing time experiments. So all of a sudden, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. He says, how, how do you know I'm doing that? It gives him a certain amount of altitude and say, well, how did you know I was doing this? So he's ahead of the, you know, ahead of the game. But it stands to reason that when he did what he did, when he discovered his first ability to, to seriously move something into time, was he approached by a higher force? you know, a, a temporal tremor detector from another realm that says, hey, you, you're doing experiments with time. What do you think you're doing? And, and who does he have to answer to besides ordinary corporate or government or even secret society people that we know nothing about? What does he have to answer to on a higher plane of existence? Now, whether he does or not consciously, it seems that there are forces in the universe that would keep him in check and furthermore, might keep him in check without identifying themselves as the gatekeepers. They might do it through uh, presidents, dictators, uh, intelligence agencies, or, or whatever. So that, that, that can be the way that some of these hierarchical authorities can act, is acting without identifying themselves. And so what happens is when I get into a situation where I see a, a synchronicity manis, manifest itself in association with the sigil and in association with David, it's like I'm, I'm hitting the territory, but I don't particularly have a map. I just have a, sort of a, a map of principle whereby I say, if I, if I stir up David Anderson and I stir up this, this part of the sigil or magic, I have a correspondence, but I have no particular explanation of it. What do you think? Well, it makes me chuckle. I thought uh, it may be better to have a map and not go anywhere than it would be to go anywhere and have no map. Um, I don't necessarily agree that there has to be uh, what Stephen Hawking called a, uh, was it a temper a temporal uh, conservation force or something like that uh, that would deteriorate any uh, potential side effects of time travel into a, a more mainstream timeline. Um, he had a lot of misunderstandings. There's a lot of things. I mean, he couldn't process data. He could only process very specific data that was in a specific paradigm. Um, as David Anderson once said, once you begin to change your position so many times, people don't take you too seriously. He was constantly changing his position on time travel because he didn't really understand uh, some of the simplicity of it, uh, in addition to other things he didn't understand. But, yeah, so... I mean, anything is, the whole universe is, is infinite and it's open-ended. But more to the point is that when you, we're talking about the map and the territory, yeah, whether it's better to have a map or not, 
uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's fun to explore the territory and you don't need a map because you have a certain amount of familiarity with it. In the case I'm dealing with here, I have the prospect that one can change time, the scientific legitimacy of changing time, manipulating time. What we don't have is the other side of the equation. We have the theory and not the, not the practical. So the theory is, is elucidating, it's, it's informative, but where, where is the individual gonna go? Where is humanity gonna go with this? What it does suggest to us is that time is a sort of a prison that we're subjected to. It, the universe is sort of a prison that we're subjected to. And when I say as a prison, it's, it's not the worst of all. For some people, it's a horrible prison. For some people who, knew, who know how to negotiate the game, it's not so bad. It's, uh, you, but sh the basic thing is you're living within confinement and limitations, which is part of the human struggle. And of course, the human struggle can be, um, you know, can be enjoyable. And you see that, that movie Goodfellas where the, the mob goes to jail and they convert the whole prison into sort of like a, an Italian cafeteria. And they, and they find a way to enjoy themselves and do their gambling and have their Italian food while they're in a you know, minimum security prison. So it's like you can, you can live. So when, when we get the idea of time, time manipulation, it gives us the prospect of being able to either escape the prison or to you know, reach beyond one's ordinary limits. And of course, that, that can create problems for the individual as well, because you know people have to be able to handle power and freedom. So this, we could say that this whole sigil that we're talking about is at the frontier of knowledge. John D. only got involved with it when he reached the apex of academia. You know, he he, he ascended, and now what was he dealing with? He was dealing with the forces and phenomena that control, rule, rule or influence um, not only the, the governments of the world, but the, the government of the world itself. And, you know, that, that's where I bump into this, you know, sigil that you so scholarly, you know, rendered in your videos. True. Um, you know, basically what I've been doing is, is defining, you know, defining the paradigm, defining, you know, the horizon, that's the limit. Okay, that, I, I don't know what else to say about it at this point, except that um, the more I explore it, the more it seems to reveal itself. Also, the one of the problems is that to understand this stuff in its fullness requires a, an ability to see beyond the third dimension. And this is very challenging to the human mind as it is typically structured in 2018. It's, it's very challenging. Um, go ahead. Well, there's just a lot of distractions and that's intentional on the part of the powers that be. They keep us distracted so that we won't be able to uh, evolve at the rate that we're supposed to in the same way that, for example, uh, an occult or secret society type group uh, starts out by diminishing the amount of power that a person normally has and then through initiation, you know, gives them back the power that they already had had that they initially sacrificed to join. Uh, they can't offer you anything that you don't already have. Uh, that's why they have to take something from you. And I feel that way about all the gatekeeping uh, and bias that we as people have. I don't think it's up there. I don't think there would be any need for there to be enforcement of natural laws. I certainly don't think that there are 
entities uh, that exceed uh, space-time that would feel the need to come back down here and wag a finger. I could be wrong. Well, it, it, it all comes down to control, and, and whether that control is, you know, neutral, good, or bad, the point of, the point of it is it is control, and it's an exterior control that, you know, we're actually talking about and uh, looking at just as a, as a part of the universe. So it's like, yes, it's, it's the juxtaposition of ourselves as a conscious entity with a controlling force that is, has the potential to be malevolent um, and limiting. Whether, whether it should be that way or should not be that way is another issue. And of course, we can only um, reach into those realms if we ourselves are, you know, what they call prepared or initiated so that we're, you know, quote unquote, worthy of that knowledge. Otherwise, we don't belong there. And the question also becomes, once we obtain that position of knowledge, power or control, do we have sympathy for the controller versus, you know, the sympathy for the aspirant? You know, many of us would try to help that aspirant and go out of our way to inform them of the correct path as opposed to keeping them down. But that also because, you know, it's like not everybody's supposed to have all the knowledge in the world. Um, it's something that you have to be responsible for and, and, and attain or obtain. But th this is a very, um, sort of it's a circular path, but it, it just sort of defines the, the playing field that we're talking about. And I, I think what we should do is, uh, you know, follow this up. We've kind of come to a end time here, uh, to use a little pun, uh, an end time for the moment. And what I'm, you know, we can take up other aspects of this in another podcast if you'd like. Oh, I'd love to. Okay, anything you'd like to say before we end off now? Oh, just, I've had a lot of fun speaking with you. Um, this has been a great experience for me, uh, and I really do hope that we get to repeat it. Okay, give your uh, give your website again. Uh, my website is www.benpadia.com. B E N P A D I A H. And there's also the Pythagorean Order of Death. Dot Ning N I N G, and the Pythagorean Order of Death is all one word. And I would also add to this that this is, podcast has been brought to you by Sky Books. Uh, Sky Books, the company where science fiction meets reality. Skybooksusa.com is the website. Skybooksusa.com. And also visit the timetraveleducationcenter.com. Thank you very much.